And belief seven was this whole thing about asymptomatic spread. Um, one in three people with COVID spread it while asymptomatic. I mean, where did this come from? How was it perpetuated for so long? The questions just gush out, really. I mean, what was your thinking on it? Um, yeah, there really, there was so much about it that was sort of so much obviously couldn't be true to me. And so you sort of go back to what did asymptomatic mean? What does asymptomatic mean? And, and the Chinese researchers were using it to mean something completely different at the outset to how we understood it here. So in their studies, when they were talking about asymptomatic, they meant not hospitalised. Literally, you know, you could be really sick, but if you weren't hospitalised, then you were being treated as asymptomatic. Um, and obviously we were thinking it meant that you were perfectly healthy, which is really quite, quite different. Um, and if we go back much, much further than that, we go right back to 1910 again and back to Charles Chapin, and who was that public health officer in Providence in New York. In Bless him. Island. <laughs> yeah, he wrote the sort of book on public health that became, you know, the, the public health Bible somehow, despite it, despite it being full of these broad brush statements and despite him concluding it saying I've made lots of broad brush statements here and probably some of them aren't true but you know it's the best we've got for now a hundred years ago and we've really not <laughs> incredible. improved on it yeah so because he had this this hypothesis he wanted to push about close contact transmission and about everybody's saliva being revolting and horrible and spreading diseases because he was a little bit OCD himself he had this problem with influenza because influenza clearly doesn't spread through close contact because it had been known for hundreds of years before then that an influenza epidemic comes on like that and you suddenly have a lot of sick people all at once. And he couldn't explain his theory. And so what he came up with was this idea that the world must be full of people who are spreading influenza without realising that they're sick. So he came up with this myth of asymptomatic spread to cover himself because he'd created this myth that it was all close contact transmission. Um, and actually what he says in his book at one point is that you can absolutely find bacteria, which is what they were mainly focused on then, they didn't have the ability to look at viruses. You could find bacteria in aerosols in the air. But, and so then he had to say, but there must be something about that bacteria that doesn't spread disease, like there's not enough of it, or it's just not virulent enough. Like, so he's making excuses, even though the evidence is there that it's in the air, because he just really wants to push this hypothesis because he was, you know, really evangelical about it. Well, you don't want a few facts to fit in the way of a good hypothesis. Oh, that's right. That's you know, right. They, they have to be rammed in and distorted yeah. and made to fit. It's, it's the classic excuse scenario, isn't it? Yeah. So w w word is that, uh, that Mary Mallon was a really good cook. And... Uh, <laughs> Apparently, apparently, I've been reading about this. Her peach desserts, apparently, were the best in New York. And, of course, she, she's known to history as Typhoid yeah. Mary, uh, round about, what, 1900, 1910. Do, do you think, and, and uh, most people will know about her, but she, she was spreading typhoid, hence the name. <laughs> um, and, but she was asymptomatic. She was kind of, of a reservoir. Do you think there was an over-extrapolation from her case? I think that that is almost certainly it. And he does mention her in his book as well. And um, you know, that was such a newsworthy item. Like people were all talking about this awful, awful situation and, and the ethics of it as well. You know, what do you do when somebody is spreading disease and killing people ultimately, but is otherwise healthy? You know, how, how does a society deal with that? That was really challenging. But the thing with typhoid is that the bacteria has this special way of hiding from the immune system that's kind of unique, unique to that salmonella that just, just you can't extrapolate from that to every other disease it's a special function of salmonella that you can have this asymptomatic carrier status and it hides away in the gallbladder from what i remember doesn't it i can't i can't remember to be it's honest out from time to time i remember that from somewhere never mind never mind yeah but you know, ultimately it results in it coming out of her gut mm, mm. Um, and and it's not true for other illnesses you know there isn't this reservoir of virus in healthy mm. people that's not a thing and so the the I guess the second important point in time for this myth of asymptomatic spread happened with the invention of the PCR test 
So the PCR test was invented in the 1980s, but didn't really take hold till the 90s. And then when it did take hold in the 90s, you could start to detect teeny tiny amounts of virus th that was not consequential and extrapolate from that to think that it was. So if you look up all the sort of research papers on asymptomatic respiratory disease, Nothing happens until the PCR comes along and then everyone's talking about it like it's an important finding. But if you remember when we were talking about testing last time, mm. you can set up PCR testing to detect virus particles in a single aerosol from the air that could just easily be breathed in and be of no consequence whatsoever to the person who's breathed it in. It's just dirty air that's in them. It's not a disease. Of course, we live in a milieu of viruses and bacteria all the time, you know, you know, and there's millions of virus. Vi I mean, and, you know, if you want to focus on any particular irrelevant virus and throw a load of money at the studies, well, hey, hey, presto, you might find it. You know, it's. Uh... Yeah, absolutely. And I think people really have lost sight of quite how amazing our immune system. Yeah. They really are amazing. They're constantly mm. Um, evolving and changing and protecting us from all sorts of rubbish that's being thrown at us. And even in babies, you know, babies, after the, sort of when they've been weaned from mum's milk, they're not protected by her antibodies anymore. They've got this naive immune system, right? It hasn't seen all this stuff. It hasn't quite learned how to do it the way that we're constantly learning. And most of the time, most of it. babies are absolutely fine. You know, they catch little things and one after another and they, they sort of learn that, uh, you know, they learn about the specifics, but mm. without learning the specifics, they're still healthy. And, and so you have to sort of bear that in mind. And it is astounding. You know, it is awe inspiring how amazing our immune systems are. Mm. And people have stopped talking about it and then become fearful of one of a multitude, as you say, of things that that, you know, potentially attacking us. You think, well, is it really attacking if they're just all in the air all the time? The immune system's good for literally nine billion different types of antigen, apart from one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and you, for that, you need a vaccine. Yeah. For that, you need lockdowns. For that, you need... Ma it's just absurd when you think of it in context. Yeah. And when I guess so, the other side of it is the immune system is beyond our understanding right so you know there's a lot we know about it and what we've known about it has changed over time but there's a lot we don't know about it really there's a huge amount we don't know about how it works and so coming along with a sledgehammer and thinking that you can fix it is a not clever thing to do because it has consequences i was reading there might even be quantum effects in, in immunity whatever that means but uh, it just shows that we are really uh, ju just paddling around in the, in, in the shallows, uh, d despite you being a pathologist. And uh, uh, yeah, and I think there was a bit of human arrogance in this as, as well, really, uh, Claire. You know, uh, if, if an infection came without a traceable source, then you know I, I can't say, well, well, I, you know, authorities can't say, well, I don't know where that infection came from. They have to make something up. Um, yes, yes, that there is so much truth in that, and that that will also. Like really undermined Charles Chapin's um, whole book. Mm -hmm. And people were saying to him, well, we know that people, you know, we, we see people who are sent home when they're well enough with diphtheria from the hospital, but they've still got diphtheria and nobody catches it. Or when, you know, they've just had tons of examples of people who were sick and are surrounded by family and friends who were not getting sick with a whole variety of diseases. And he even what he did with that is he sort of said, well, take scarlet fever say you know there are a lot of children who are going around who aren't that sick with that scarlet fever so that's probably asymptomatic spread too like, well no they, they're a little bit sick actually mm. um, so you know it's, it's just constantly trying to shoehorn things into a into a mess that suits when when actually that's not how science should be done you know you have to sort of take a step back from your biases and see what's going on and observe and measure mm. it's and, interesting I, I'm quite old now. When I was a young staff nurse, I worked with the uh, the generation of consultants that, that went through the war, and um, they, they were trained maybe in the 1940s, 50s, and they, they diagnosed largely on clinical grounds. Mm -hmm. And then I remember, you know, there was quite a clear change about late 80s, 
And uh, we had this new generation of consultants coming through and it was test that, what that numbers that. You know, not saying all that stuff's wrong, it's brilliant. But, you know, may, may, maybe this sort of quantification in this testing has, has, has taken over, you know, how ill is this patient is maybe the, more, the, the, mo the most fundamental question to, to ask. Oh. And, yeah, and, absolutely, uh, absolutely, and um, and yeah, but the testing is. You're right. The testing was sort of put on too high a pedestal, really, and yeah. that and that led to a lot of the problems with the beliefs about asymptomatic spread. So, the the key papers at the beginning were ones where there had been tons and tons of testing. So either in China or in Italy, there was one place in Italy called Vo, where they tested the whole town, and they did it twice. And they found occasional positives where um, the two people who had no symptoms and had positives had, had you know, been in a cafe together or whatever. They said, well, this is asymptomatic spread. But neither of them ever got sick. Like, these are just random positives that you will get. You will get a tiny proportion that are positive if you're testing thousands of people. And you mustn't extrapolate from that to make huge assumptions about the spread of disease. Yeah, and the other thing that happened that, that I found slightly mind-boggling, actually, is that there were tons and tons of papers written about asymptomatic spread. And when you actually broke it down, the majority of them were written about people who had no symptoms but had a positive test result with no evidence of spread of any kind or no attempt to look at spread. Just these, these people exist. You're like, okay, well, that's proven nothing. And then you look at the, the, the other half, and they were mostly meta-analyses. So meta-analyses just like being produced and reproduced again and again. And you go down to which papers they were referencing, and it was the same tiny handful of papers that were being recycled yeah. into this sort of claimed body of evidence that just yeah. didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, and there was, one, there was one particular paper that really it all hung from, which was this... Um, paper about the Malaysia outbreak from the religious festival where um, there were two situations where it sounded like there may have been minor symptoms after you know after people had come back um, and I wrote to the author of that paper to ask questions like you know how many people did you test because that's fundamental to understanding this mm -hmm. and she wrote about the first time but the second time I've just not had replies from her. And really, I can see why she might have gone a bit quiet, because literally the whole world changed their behaviour on the back of what she wrote. Mm -hmm. And that's slightly terrifying for her, mm -hmm. I imagine. I, I um, would imagine so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, it, but if you do get it wrong, it would be good to sort of at, le so. at least add nuance to your yeah. response. So interesting, just a simple translation error on the meaning of asymptomatic because mm -hmm. you know me me medics in the uk we try we try and use terminology very accurately so asymptomatic a without literally it means completely without symptoms but mm. clearly yeah. it is not what the chinese mean and it does sound like the chinese definition is pragmatically much more useful as well and i mean yeah. I, I, can, I can actually remember chris witty talking about this he said with asymptomatic spread it will be confirmed if we later find people who were completely asymptomatic and yet develop antibodies. That's right. He did and, say that. But, but, but then when that didn't happen, he didn't seem to go back and say, oh, you, you know that day when I said, this, well, to tell you the truth, these people haven't been developing antibodies and they never got sick, so really they never had it at all. I, I, mean, so I mean, there was no so correction was, as they went along. No, and he was really bigging that up at that press conference. Yeah. Press conference. He was saying, you know, what's, we've got this situation, there's a lot we don't know at the moment, and we're getting these antibody tests out, and they're going to make all the difference in the world because they're going to show us how big a problem this really was, how many people have really had it. And then the results came through, and then silence. Um, and, you know, I could see how if they are so stuck in their belief system if they really believed that this was a big problem, and like most of the world was believing it at the time, so you can see how that they'd be swept along, then you'd say, well, hang on a minute. If this antibody test isn't showing what we are expecting, can we blame the test? And I think that might have been what's going through their minds, is they're thinking, well, the antibody test obviously wasn't picking up these weaker things. But it's not true. I think the antibody tests are really sound, actually. At least the ones that were being done in the UK were. So... If you look across the world, there's quite a lot, big range in the types of results you got from antibody mm. testing. 
And I don't think that it was all done in the same way. But the way that the public health bodies were doing it in England was really reproducible. Um, and I think it was a really good measure of who had it in each wave up until recently, when I'm not so convinced, to be honest. But I think for the pre-Omricon ones, I think it was a pretty good measure. Mm -hmm. How long, scientifically speaking, now do you think someone is infectious for before they go on to develop symptoms and antibodies? Is there a pre-symptomatic um, so that's a really period. important question, isn't it? And, and we should have really clarified that before. But I think it's really important to separate out asymptomatic people who never get infections and who, yep. you know, which was the excuse for lockdowns and, and, you know, and separated people and mask wearing, all of that was based on the premise that healthy people were not healthy. And then this pre-symptomatic pre window. So that exists, right? You know, people will people who go on to develop symptoms, at which point they become very infectious, mm. have a few days prior where they, the infection has begun. And so you sort of, you know, you're on the up exponentially in terms of the amount of virus that's yeah. there. And then, of course, once you start coughing, that's when you're really producing volume of virus. But hypothetically, there is a little moment in time when you're not quite coughing and there's still a lot of virus that's being produced in your breath. Um, and so, you know, that that is a hypothetical problem. But there are two, there's two important things to know about that. One is that the story that really um, everybody focused on around pre-symptomatic spread was a story about a Chinese businesswoman who came to a meeting in Germany and she started a little COVID outbreak there. And... It was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. One of the authors was Christian Drosten, and they reported that asymptomatic spread was clearly this big problem because of this woman causing to, a few people to be sick. And they, this paper was really picked up on. They, in retrospect, a journalist thought, well, they, you know, we should look into this a bit more because they didn't give very much detail about what was going on with her. And they found her and they interviewed her. She was really ill. She'd gone to this meeting completely dosed to the nines because she had a fever and she couldn't get through it in any other way. And they hadn't interviewed her. And they, they did have a supplementary as, um, bit of that paper about her illness. But they have never corrected it. They've never retracted it. It's still there. It's still in it's, the literature. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that, I think that's really important to note that that was a lie. Um, and then second of all, the question you have to ask is, how much of an impact does that little window of time have on the overall trajectory of a wave? Because, you know, if the wave's going up and away and, and doing its own thing because it's spread through the air, which is what I think is happening, then it, there's nothing you can do about any of it anyway. It's just it's on its own trajectory. But if you want to sort of believe in the close contact thing, you could still question that and say, well, how much of an impact does it have? And there was one paper from Singapore where they, you know, they'd, they'd had a sort of smaller outbreak. So it was easier to measure these things in places where it had gone everywhere. And they reckoned that 7% was down to pre-symptomatic spread. So 7%, you know, that was the only number anyone ever put on it. Still surprisingly high, I would have thought. But... I think it is surprisingly high. I, think, I don't think I entirely believe it as 7%, but there it is. But it's the only study we've got, yeah. But the point yeah. is, even if it were 7%, that's not worth locking the country down for, mm. is it? No, incredible. I mean, and I love the way that you summarise in your book, Claire, uh, top three myths. One in three people with COVID never develop symptoms. Myth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People who uh, never develop symptoms uh, have made others sick, myth. Mm -hmm. um, an, or an organism in the respiratory tract that uh, never enters a cell is still an infection. Yeah, yeah. Not true.